Hey, it's Clay. Hope you guys are doing well. Welcome to another video. This is going to be an introduction and overview of a new amplifier that I just built. It is a single-ended EL34 based amp, kind of resembling a plexi or a baseman in the base man in the preamp uh, with some kind of tweaks and modifications of my own taste. Um, in this video, I'm going to kind of do a little bit of an overview. The amplifier is actually already built, but I'm going to kind of go back to the beginning process and kind of highlight some of the you know, the build objectives that I had going into it, the design choices that I made. We'll kind of do an overview of the amp, maybe do a brief kind of see how the circuit flows through everything. And then ultimately we'll have some, to some tone clips here following up probably in a supplementary video. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, but if you're in tube amplifiers and are curious to see uh, how I went and built one for my own uses, stay tuned. To start, I'm gonna go through some of the initial motivations that I had in putting this build together. The uh, primary thing that I was looking for was um, I wanted to make a combo amp that I could bring out for live use. Combos are just really easy to grab and go in my situation. I have a combo amp. It's the 6AU6 uh, combo that I built previously. Uh, you do a search on my channel for videos on that, and I also have a link down in the description to the build thread on that amp. That amp has, I think, dual 6V6s in the power section, producing maybe 15 to 20 watts and uh, is a 1x12 combo. I really like that amp, but there are certain gigs where it, um, it's maybe a little bit too big, something that I would need something a little bit lower powered. So I wanted to go for a single-ended amp. Now, I had built some single-ended amps in the past. I started with a 5F2A Champ, and I believe I also did an EL84-based Vibro Champ, and um, both of those were heads. One of them is actually with a cousin of mine, and the other one, the um, you know, it just didn't necessarily hit the mark for what I was looking for. So I wanted to go with something maybe slightly different, and incorporate some different features that would kind of really tailor it for my live use requirements. With um, with live use, I find that oftentimes my guitar amps are just too powerful, and and you, you know for a tube amp, you really kind of want to get it crank get crank up the master volume, and it just kind of breaks your soul a little bit to keep it so low. Um, I had been experimenting a little bit with using a compressor into a very clean amp running at low volume, and that kind of was an okay substitute, but ultimately I wanted something where I could push the master up a little bit higher to get into some of that compression and power tube distortion uh, without really kind of blowing people away. So uh, on the flip side, I didn't want to go so terribly low that um, it kind of would disappear. So the middle ground that I found would be to use an EL34 in the power section. Um, and, and also I had a power transformer on hand that would be perfect for that. So that was build objective number two was to utilize as many of the parts that I have accumulated as possible. And I always really kind of like to be thrifty and making use of what I've got on hand, kind of the parts that I have collected into my stash just over years of collecting and building tube amps. I had purchased a bunch of transformers uh, in kind of a collector, kind of a bunched deal, and this is one of them, is an Allen TP25 power transformer, kind of meant for a champ style amp, but also had higher voltage and higher current to support a tube like an EL34, so it seemed like a perfect fit for that. Then really the remaining objectives would be to do something that would be extremely reliable. When I build this amp, I want to have it so that I can take it to my gigs and I never have to worry about it failing or causing any problems. So that caused me to be a little more simple. I'm not necessarily going to put a lot of features in or a lot of tweaks or modifications or switches or pots. I'm just going to kind of go for more of a vanilla, straightforward style amp to just kind of deliver the goods in a very uh, reliable manner. All right, so now we're on the computer. I want to take a look at... Uh, the circuit that I put together for this amplifier. One of the things I have discovered, it is easiest to start with the power supply and then work backwards from there. The power supply is really probably the most fixed part of the amp. And, you know, your choice of power transformer is probably the most fundamental of design choices that really everything else stems from. So the power transformer that I had on hand is this Allen TP25. Um, the primary information is highlighted here. We got a 310, 0310B plus at 150 milliamps. So the, the voltage here, this, this means we're putting out two, uh, we got 310 on one side, a center tap, and then 310 on the other side. That you know, So that's going to be, if you put 120 volts on the primary, it's going to produce that on the secondary. And then that can help you kind of estimate what kind of voltage you're going to get in your circuit using Ohm's Law. Uh, if you if you kind of understand how much current is going to be drawn through all of the tubes, and then how mo also uh, what kind of target voltage you want, you can use your use that to set your B plus step down resistors. 
Now this 150 milliamps is also important because that helps us to, to know what kind of power tube we can draw. Uh, we can use a, you know, a 12x7 preamp tube, I think only draws like one milliamp of current, so it's kind of irrelevant. But the power tube is pretty meaningfully different. You know, a, the difference between an EL84 and an EL34 is pretty substantial. An EL34 draws quite a lot of current. Uh, so you need to have a much beefier uh, power transformer to support that if that's the kind of tube that you're going to use. Um, then we also have 6.3 volts on 4.5 amps of current. That also determines how many tubes you can run. Um, you know, if, if you're going to run tremolo or reverb uh, or have a lot of input channels, you know, maybe uh, cascading gain stages, number, number, you know, four or five. 12x7s in the preamp, you need to have enough 6.3 volts to, to supply the heater voltage to each of these tubes. And then also we have a 5 volt tap at 2 amps that is going to determine what kind of tube rectifier we're going to use if you want to use one at all. You have the opportunity to do so. Now I believe there are certain tube rectifiers that require more than 2 amps of current, so those would not be um, valid tubes here. We also have a 50 volt bias tap. Uh, the bias tap would allow us to potentially, I think, use a... Um, Instead of a cathode bias, more of a fixed bias, um, but that was irrelevant to my uses as well. And then we've also got some nice center tap heater winding. That's nice to know. And then we don't have to do an elevated uh, heater wiring. And then we also have an internal hum shield, which is nice to kind of help reduce some noise. So overall, a very robust power transformer that will be excellent, I think, for a build like this. So very pleased to have that. So uh, based upon that transformer, I did a Google search just to confirm exactly what the leads, the colors of the leads are, and I came up with this little hand-drawn schematic for my power supply. Now I bring the power in off of an IEC cable. Uh, I really like to have an IEC jack, kind of like what you'd find on the back of a computer or a computer monitor. I, I love to be able to plug that into my amp and then unplug it. That's my preferred method of choice. Um, your middle tab, your, your, your ground, your green wire is always going to be your safety ground that I, I put on an independent bolt on the chassis, and you want to make sure it's safely secured, you know, with a with a toothed washer, and, and you just make sure that it's as safe and sturdy as possible. You're establishing that ground connection. This will prevent any sort of voltage from going onto the transformer in a way that could, or onto the chassis in a way that could harm you. You will always have this reference to earth, literal earth, uh, so that your high voltage will never harm you uh, on ground. Next, we've got the, the small lead is our hot lead, and then the longer lead is our neutral lead. Now, I've set this side of the, this is the primary side of the power transformer very intentionally. You really want to have the hot lead. This is going to have your 120 volts of alternating current from the wall. You want it to go into the fuse and then into a on-off switch. Um, you don't want to switch this around because if you put the fuse and the on-off on this on this neutral side, that means that the 120 volts is going to go through your power transformer even, you know, once you plug into the wall. Now, it won't complete the circuit and, and turn it on until the on-off switch is turned on, but, you know, you still will have voltage inside the power transformer, uh, and you want to avoid that. So this is a, more, a safer way of wiring up your primary side. Then on the secondary, we've got a lot of leads got the yellow leads, that's your 5 volt for your tube filament, which I just tied off. Got a red and a red, that's going to be our high voltage B+. Red green is the bias tap, just tied that off to itself. The red yellow I grounded, center tap for the B+. Green and green is your 6.3 heaters. And then green yellow is the center tap, which I also grounded. And then orange was just the shield, and I grounded that as well. And I did find that to be correct. So you can use this uh, as you see fit. I initially put together two, um, this is not actually right, these are, uh, should be 5408 diodes or uh, 4007. Um, so that, that's a little bit of a typo there. Uh, and I'll get back to that later, but I, I use diode rectification. Again, I'm using an EL34 power tube so I can handle quite a bit higher plate voltage. So I chose to go with diode rectification, and I, I like diodes. They're a little bit more stable. You don't have to worry about a tube failing. Um, they're pretty cheap. I, I just kind of like using diodes uh, in my amps. Then we've got an initial filter stage here. With, uh, with diodes, you can use larger 
uh, your initial filter cap can be a little larger. So I went 47 UF. I think you can go higher than that. Whereas with a tube rectifier, you usually have to be careful of not getting much past like 32-ish. Uh, then we also got a bleeder resistor here, I believe is what this one is, 220K at 2 watts. So once the amp is turned off, all the voltage stored up in the capacitors is going to be bled a little bit more quickly to ground through this resistor. 100 ohm, 5 watt step down uh, resistor just to help space off these two. So we've got a little bit better filtering here. Then um, we've got our B plus 1 node. This is going to the uh, output transformer, which will eventually feed the plate of the EL34, another 40. 447 UF cap at 450 volts. These caps, I think, might be 50 microfarad at 500 volts, but I'm not exactly sure. And then we've got a 1K resistor at 2 watts to step down our B plus again, B plus node again, and then a 10K, 1 watt, and a four, another 47. So just a pretty straightforward B plus step down circuit. <clears throat> A lot of this came actually from Merlin Blenko's website on uh, smoothing and filtering. I think this is pretty much where I um, took a lot of my my advice from. So I, I think I may have even changed some of these values as we move forward. But that was kind of the initial inspiration for my power supply. Next, I started... So once I had some of my initial design choices in place... I actually, let me go back to this thread. I put this together. So what I did here is I tried to estimate what my voltages are going to be, right? So I believe you can um, estimate this. Now 310, this is our volts AC RMS, and then it goes through the rectifier. Let's actually open this on a new picture here. And then, um, I estimated that would be about 416 volts DC. I believe if you take this times 1.414 is approximately how you can estimate it. Then using Ohm's law, V equals RC, you can punch some of these numbers in. Now I estimated 76 milliamps. The data sheet for Neil 34 says 62 milliamps. And then I just estimated, here's another 9.6 going to the screen of the L34. Again, it all came from the data sheet. Then I had two... 12AX7, so that's 1, 2, 3, 4 milliamps of total current. That's how I got that number. So again, just using Ohm's Law, V equals RC, and some algebra, you can kind of estimate, you know, so I've got 408 volts here, going down, I think, to uh, 345, and then 336, and then I ultimately, again, these are the voltages going down to the tubes. So I was just kind of estimating if this is where my voltages are at. I think I even changed a little bit of the numbers here. we got 4.7k dropping resistors instead. So just trying to estimate and, and predict where my voltages are going to be so that I can uh, make some further design choices moving forward. So based upon all of that, I went and found some schematics that could kind of point me in the right direction. And I came across this one. This is AX84's SEL schematic. This has a KT88 in the power sage, but I believe an EL34 could be used as well. And I mostly just use this as kind of a template to gain some ideas from. Um, you know, this is where you can see, I think, where I initially got my, my dropping resistors and just how I would set everything up on this secondary side. And, and then also I really took a lot of inspiration over here on this power tube on how to wire everything. I pretty much took it straight away from this 5.6K resistor moving all the way to the output transformer, everything. It was pretty much taken note for note uh, from a working existing schematic. Now I also found good inspiration here on this middle section. Uh, we've got, this is the V2 here, we've got a cathode follower into a tone stack with some nice little modifications to to kind of the traditional Marshall Plexi or basement design and then a master volume. I also pretty much took all of this section as well uh, for inspiration. I found that this was a really nice way to lay out kind of that basement tone stack with the cathode follower, which was something I wanted to use. And then really from there, I also wanted to do, I'm going to have another 12AX7 
and I wasn't quite certain exactly how I was going to wire that up. Um, but you can really do whatever you want with those input stages. Having everything else in place, you have a lot of creative flexibility in the preamp to really do whatever you want. So um, a lot of the details really have been sorted out at this point. All right, all of that has led me to this point. This is kind of the final schematic that I ended up with at the end of the day after testing the amp and everything. Um, so I will leave a link to this down in the description below if you wish to review it. But as you can see, it has everything that we talked about. And then this front end preamp section, I diverted a little bit. I you know kind of have a basement plexi input style, but just a single input jack with a 33K um, plate res or a grid stopping resistor. And uh, that's going to feed both of these channels. And in my opinion, um, this was just a nice way, you know, it's, it's basically like you are jumpering the channels permanently, and then you can just use the volume controls over here to determine how you're going to mix the input from each of those channels. Now, this top side, we've got the normal channel. This is a very kind of straightforward, typical setup, right? We've got an 820 bias resistor, which is actually pretty warm, full frequency cathode bypass cap, 100K plate resistor, 0.022 coupling cap, 500K normal volume, 470K mixing resistor. Very kind of standard vanilla V1 gain stage from a ton of different amp circuits. Then on V1B, this is my bright channel. I made some kind of interesting choices here. We've got a 3K bias with a 0.47 microfarad cap. So that's going to be a little bit of a cooler bias, a little bit more harmonics. Um, and it's also going to be brighter because we are bleeding. I don't know exactly where 0.47 is, but this with uh, this creates a um, high pass filter. So I think everything at about 100 hertz ish and below is going to actually be rolled off and is not going to be cathode bypassed. 220k plate resistor again, just to tweak the bias a little bit, um, just to get a little bit of different flavor in terms of the harmonic structure from V1A. And then a 0 0.0022 UF uh, coupling cap is going to be quite a bit brighter. Then we also have 500k volume, and then the mixing resistor has a 500 picofarad uh, cap to to bypass that. So all of you know, really these, this 0.47 cap, this this 0.002 cap, and this 500 picofarad cap are all going to make this channel quite a bit brighter. So by mixing these two volumes, I really have an additional set of EQ controls on top of my tone stack uh, that I think is really, really nice. Some other just quick design elements I want to shout out is R14 and D1. This is something I also got from Merlin Blenko's page. Um, let's see if we can find it. Uh, it's taken from this stage on the DC cathode follower. These are just some little tweaks and modifications. I'm not going to repeat anything here. If you want to know what benefit it provides, please read through this page. But I think this is just a extra way to help secure and make this extra stage very safe and, and functional. Then I made some subtle tweaks to the, the tone stack, 75K slope resistor, 0.01 base cap, 0.02 mid cap, um, a fairly large 50K mid pot. And then I also do have a lift control. When you break the connection from the mid pot to ground, you actually defeat the tone stack and send everything through. Um, whereas if you leave the mid pot in, it does allow the filtering to have a way to, sh to shunt some of those frequencies to ground. Just a nice little modification that I really enjoy. And so overall, yeah, this is the circuit that I went with. Uh, if you guys have any questions about the circuit, please let me know in the comment section down below. Uh, but this is going to kind of tie off that part of the video, and we'll go on towards the fabrication and the construction of the amp next. Thanks for watching. Bye.